Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you have a lovely weekend. You had a lo lo lovely weekend that you were able to relax a little bit after submitting the um, midterm task on on Friday. Uh, if you have any questions regarding your uh, your work, of course, you're welcome to come talk to me about this in office hours. We can go over that and I'll give you some of the details. For uh, the background today, I want to thank um, Mr. Jacob that sent this picture of the uh, spaceship Endeavour, which went over Houston before uh, flying to its uh, permanent display in, uh, in California. Um, my son, actually, my younger son, will uh, thank you even more as a giant fan of space and NASA and all those things. So thank you for that anyway. Let's start to talk about today's topic. So today we'll begin a whole new topic. Uh, related to international agreements, international institutions. But before we do that, as always, on uh, Thursday, I finished a discussion about the political economy aspect of international relations, uh, talking about two of the main uh, policy tools that are used, either sanctions or foreign aid. Uh, when I talked about sanctions, the main motivations, the main idea behind the use of sanctions is intended to comply a change in behavior on the uh, actor that we uh, uh, apply the sanctions on. Uh, the main theoretical uh, logic to, to um, understand sanctions and behavior of the actors that are uh, facing sanctions was use the selectorate theory model, talking about the winning coalition, reminding you that every leader focuses first and foremost on, its, on her own survival. And she doesn't necessarily have to appease all members of her electorate, of the people that can support her. She has to um, appease the ones that's going to ensure that she'll be able to survive in office. The winning coalition is much bigger in a democracy compared to autocracy, which means that it's much harder for leaders in democracies to uh, appease everyone, makes, them, makes democracies more sensitive to uh, sanctions, which reminding you are intended to create those economic costs on the public. And that leads to the first effect that I talked about the deprivation effect, the public pressure, the leaders to change their behavior. On the other hand, I gave the example with the study about Israel that tested the public and showed that the possibility of a backlash effect in which the public will rally around the leader, disagreeing with the costs that are imposed by the sanctions and actually increase the, effect, the support for uh, the government make sanctions much less, much less likely to be useful. So we talked about that. Then when I talked about foreign aid, a tool that is intended mostly to uh, generate policy concessions from the actor which receives this foreign aid. The uh, tendency to fail because motivation sometimes is well beyond just humanitarian um, uh, objective. And then also using selector theory to uh, explain the problems of dictators with a, the fact that dictators are gonna use this extra resource they have not to provide to the population because the population doesn't matter to them. What matters to dictators, reminding you again, they have a smaller winning coalition, only members of their family or their extended family or members of their party or members of the military leadership, providing those extra resources to uh, members of their coalition in order to ensure that they survive in office. So that was the problem with aid especially given to uh, those kinds of regimes. If you have any other questions related to that, you're more than welcome to email me or come talk to me in office hours. Let's shift on to today. So today, this week's topic is international treaties, international institutions. We will discuss the foundations for why actors have motivations to join cooperative international agreements. Also why they have motivations, what type of motivations they have to renege on those kinds of agreements and what are the agreements are supposed to do in those kinds of situations? And how are these dynamics translate to participation in international institutions and signing those kinds of agreements? So let's start with some basic definitions. A treaty is a formal agreement between sovereign states. It's one of the central tools of conduct in international relations. It has been uh, used for many, many, many years. Today, there's over 3,000 types of multilateral agreements, which means there's multiple states that sign those kinds of agreements. And there's all over 27,000 bilateral treaties. So two actors signing those kinds of agreements, just to get you a sense of where we stand. Uh, 
some of the historical examples, uh, some of them you're probably familiar with. So I already talked about NATO before. NATO is based on a treaty that was signed in 1949 uh, between the United States and some other uh, actors forming NATO. Uh, a couple of years later, the Warsaw Pact was another international treaty in the context of uh, international security mostly that was signed. The Warsaw Pact, of course, was led by the Soviet Union at the time of the Cold War. And those two types of agreements shaped the security environment, mostly during the Cold War, but also had some aspects to the way that the security environment is today. Uh, be, uh, under this sign, you see the map of Europe in 1648, which was uh, after the signing the Treaty of Westphalia. This treaty serves as one of the most important foundations of the modern state system. It led to the creation of the modern nation states uh, that were the basics for Europe until, uh, until uh, as it is today in the entire world. And on the left hand, we see a copy here of the Treaty of Peace, which was the Treaty of Versailles, signed in 1918, and that was the end of the First World War. And there's, of course, a lot of uh, other types of uh, treaties. We'll get to that. So after a short history lesson, let's talk a little bit more about the theoretical foundations and the important elements of those types of uh, mechanisms. So treaties are important in creating legal obligations between the actors that sign them. However, they also uh, involve the aspect of custom in the sense that behavior is uh, based on practice. So it's less predicated on written laws and uh, less uh, requiring the uh, intervention of international courts in order to interpret those laws. So that's another uh, element that can come into play when we talk about international treaties. Um, while those treaties create obligations, legal obligation, legal instruments, not all of them are always binding. And we can think about two types of uh, binding uh, instruments in this case. First, we have the hard law types of binding. It suggests uh, a requirement to follow the rules, so it has a legal obligations. And research that have looked at those types of uh, treaties show that states that use those kinds of uh, mechanisms use the restricted language when they want to uh, avoid from high transaction costs that are associated with future interactions. Because if those actors are intended to pursue their interaction in the future, they don't want to get any kind of additional aspect going into their interactions in the future, or into their uh, overall, their relationship, whether it is in the context of trade or national security or whatever that is, they just prefer to just uh, code everything into a, into a law, which makes it easier. Uh, the other type is what's called soft law, it has a more suggestive language and based on costume, as I mentioned before. Uh, unlike these hard law type, this type of uh, agreements are more likely when states face high negotiation costs. So if it's gonna be very hard to agree on the language that's gonna be used in the agreement, it's easier for those kinds of actors that are engaged in so those kinds of interactions to just use an agreement based on soft law, which is more suggestive in nature. One of the important aspects of international treaties is the need to ratify them, which means that every nego agreement negotiated in the international system has to be approved domestically. Without ratification, um, states are not bound by it. It needs to be ratified in order to be binding. Um, however, ratification is not a must. It doesn't have to be. The, not every international treaty the United States has signed has to be ratified by the Senate or the Congress or by Congress overall. Um, the rules are varying, of course, by states. And some of the important aspects that uh, relate to that are related to sp specifically the procedures in the process ratification. So uh, procedures which are more complex or multiple procedures to ratify agreement uh, imply real purpose, a real dedication for uh, actually complying with the agreement, which is an important one. Countries that have more complex uh, bureaucracy uh, to, uh, to ratify those kinds of agreement may be a better signal for how likely they are to follow it through. Uh, 
even though those are more technical kind of aspects that relate to accepting goals in the agreements in the domestic sense, and they underestimate the role that uh, norms play uh, in a treaty. So we have to think about that as well. Uh, one final aspect really uh, with just the basic introduction when we are still in the introduction phase of international treaties is the idea of itself uh, Self-enforcing agreement is one of the most accepted types of agreements, especially when it comes to international uh, relations. And it, based on the rational uh, model and the rational assumptions of international uh, international system, such as we have in neoliberalism and other types of models, that there is no third party to enforce the agreement. So, if the United States and France, for example, sign an international treaty, there's no other party that can enforce that on either one of the sides. So that's what's called a self-enforced agreement. And how does it work? Again, we are thinking about it in the context of rational choice. So each one of the signing parties engages in a cost-benefit analysis of the treaty. And they will adhere to the treaty as long as the gains from it will outweigh the cost of abrogating it. It is actually enforced by the parties themselves and they control the benefits. And if it's some, for some reason, one of the parties or both parties that signed the agreement view the benefits as, uh, view the agreement as less beneficial, then they can actually change that or they can just cancel the agreement altogether. But when you think about it from a, from a rational standpoint, that's the logic that leads to the creation of those and the compliance with self-enforcing uh, agreements. I wanna talk now about different elements related to trees, how trees are kept, how trees are designed and written, and then we'll go into a more uh, different types of, uh, of agreement. So the most powerful mechanism or one of the most important mechanisms to uh, ensure enforcement is reciprocity. Reciprocity uh, is a factor that is important in order to explain compliance for agreement based on both positive or negative incentives. We can think about it from the positive standpoint that by signing this agreement, the signatures have a motivation uh, that cooperating over the long run will provide them a lot more benefits. At the same time, compliance may be also be based on negative motivation, and that is fears of retaliation or setting of a bad precedent. Uh, one of the ways that we can use, we can explain the idea of reciprocity in interactions between two actors using prisoner's dilemma, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I'll talk about it a little bit uh, in a second. All right, so uh, we can use the prisoner's dilemma in order to understand how reciprocity is central to both positive uh, incentives in terms of cooperation, as well as negative intention in terms of not going into a conflict. I'm not gonna go uh, into multiple details about the prisoner's dilemma because I'm sure you're familiar with and I don't wanna spend the entire lecture on that. But the basic setting is that two criminals are caught by the police and the police is trying to establish or to understand who is to blame and how to, uh, how to charge them. So each one of them is presented with this, uh, with this option. They can tell who is responsible for uh, the crime and then the, the, the criminal, in this case, let's say that A will spill the beans, if you want to call it this way, he will go free and his comrade or his associate will serve time in prison. The same option is offered to the other one and they have to decide what they want to do. Uh, we can, I want to think about it mostly in the context of the number of interactions between actions. So the prisoner dilemma was developed in the 1950s. It offers a simple representation of strategic interaction between actors. It was developed mostly as a, as a one-shot game. It means that there is, we're looking at one interaction between the actors. And both actors in this case, both A and B, have the temptation to defect because if I'm going to rot and tell the truth about what happened, I'm likely to go, to go free. Um, this, I will get the most gain. I will pay nothing, actually. I will just go, uh, I will be free, and my uh, associate will uh, serve the time. But we have to think about it also in a strategic standpoint that if A thinks like that, and that's where reciprocity starts to creep in, he, has to, he should think about it He's, as, a rational, uh, as a rational decision maker. He can think of the fact that actor B should also have the same kind of logic. So both of them should not necessarily go with that route. Again, staying with the uh, uh, one-shot type of game, what's 
the most likely outcome is that both of them will uh, will be, will prefer to uh, defect from the game to betray one another, and the outcome is going to be that both of them will actually serve time in jail. Even though when we think about it, the most efficient outcome is for both of them to stay silent and they will serve uh, just one year. This is an outcome which is more likely uh, in uh, what's called a multiple iteration game. So interactions between the actors, not just prisoners in this specific uh, case, but more than that, is over time there's multiple interactions. So that means that if actors are going to interact more into the future, they're more likely they're better off if they will uh, cooperate with one another. And this outcome is the best possible outcome, of course. Uh, this is outcome which is also defined as a Nash equilibrium solution for the game. Reminding you, Nash equilibrium, I talked about it a little bit uh, when I talked about the rational choice model. It's a situation where no actor can move from that state and both of them will be better off because A would prefer, of course, this outcome over this outcome, but B would not. So it's not a better outcome. So this is the Nash solution for the game. And Again, I don't want to go into details about the multiple ways to solve prisoner's dilemma, but reciprocity is one of the most powerful aspects in this case because each actor should also consider what the other actor is going to be like. That's the rational solution for the game. If I'm going to also think about how you're going to choose, then we should get to realization that cooperation is better uh, in the long run. So that's the prisoner's dilemma in this case, and that serves as an important way to think about how reciprocity is powerful. We can think about also this is, if the setting here is not two criminals in a prisoner's dilemma game, you can think about two nations trying to come up with an international agreement. So again, if they're expected to keep this interaction between them, country A and country B in the long run, they're better off cooperating if we think about it in the context of this game. Um, there's another solution. There's other solutions to the game that are not necessarily based on a strategic interaction. Uh, and they actually involve a little bit more uh, fun, but let's let's watch just, I wanna show you something now. We'll watch the following clip and then talk about it later. So the setting is the movie Dark Knight, which most of you, uh, I guess, have shown, have uh, saw already in the past. And it, uh, just a minute, let me share the screen properly. There it is. And it shows you a good example of the prisoner's dilemma setting. Let's just watch that and then I'll talk about it for a few more seconds. So, go back here. Then we can talk about it. So, what this clip shows pretty nicely is the setting of the prisoner's dilemma. Both of those boats has the ability to, if we go back to uh, this one, so A and B are both boats, and both of them has the remote for detonating the other boat. So, both of them has the possibility to, to defect from that game, to left alive and lead to the death of the other people on the boat. Uh, one of the things that the story uh, describes in the movie is that in order to avoid from that solution, that eventually that's what happens, but we'll get to the second, to, in a second to the eventual solution, the Joker tells them that unless somebody is going to pull the trigger, he's going to blow both of them up. So he wants to avoid from their cooperation, which essentially is what happens eventually. And one more thing that you can see on that, on that video clip is that just like the prison dilemma basic setting, uh, 
there's no communication between both actors because they show pretty clearly that they both cannot communicate. And that's what you had also here with the prisoners. So that's another important aspect. Uh, the way it's solved eventually, it's based on the fact that they talk a little bit about, uh, they show in one scene, they show that the people on the boat, not the criminal's boat, but the other boat, they don't have the guts for that. Uh, the people on the criminal boats actually solve from themselves the game because if, you, if we say that A is the criminal's boat, if you remember, there's a, at some point in that scene, one of the criminals take the remote from the person responsible and throw it away. So in a way, he puts the uh, criminal's boat in this area because they have no way to actually defect from the game. So he puts the entire pressure on the common people, whether they are gonna betray the criminals or cooperate. And then in order to not wait for the actual uh, solution of the game, we also have Batman who comes in and help, but that's just an additional aspect into the story. But the idea behind it is just to show you how uh, nicely you can put in this, and uh, you can display this kind of setting of interaction and how much does this basic a formulations of relationship between two actors can can be viewed in so many different settings. So let's go back to uh, international agreements or setting or treaties because that's the topic. So reciprocity is a very important, powerful uh, mechanism in the context of international treaties. They can explain the uh, stability of trade relations over time. Again, this is the more uh, positive aspect of it. And the negative, in the, in the case of ne negative incentives, we can think about the fact that uh, states will not go into conflict because of concerns about a retaliation, responding in kind to military aggression. Uh, all right, so self-enforced and treatant, treaties relate to international law through the idea of credible commitment. One of the potential problems with ensuring compliance to those kinds of agreement is the motivation or the risk for reneging, right? Remember, we talked about credible commitment. If one side has motivations not to, to comply with the agreement because of different aspects, and maybe uh, he will renege on the agreement and then the benefits for both sides will not be uh, as powerful. Uh, one of the objectives of an international agreement signed from an international standpoint is to reduce those kinds of incentives by creating conditions that's going to ensure uh, benefits due to long-term cooperation. And how do we do that? International agreements involve costs, different types of costs that are intended to strengthen the credibility of the treaties. So one thing is one type is ex ante cost, which are sunk cost, and they offer credibility, and they um, and they signal a sincere intention to uh, keep the treaty and to, co to comply with it, paying those costs beforehand, which what's ex ex the idea of ex ante cost, uh, signals that the government is committed and it has the intention to comply with the agreement and keep with that. So by having those kinds of costs into the design of the agreement, the, the, the treaty, it's more likely also to uh, to make both uh, sign, the sides that sign the agreement to comply with it. The other type is the ex post types of costs, which are paid in case of violation. They are an important mechanism and they uh, create incentives for others to uh, avoid from defection because of those types of costs. There's different types of mechanisms, including uh, arbitration, prosecution, and dispute settlement. And uh, overall, having those kinds of costs into the design of the agreement makes it more likely that uh, the agreement will be, uh, will be kept. And that leads me to the second theoretical mechanism when thinking about enforcement, and that's reputation. So the idea is that compliance with an agreement is a function of securing the reputation of the, sign the sides that, act, that sign that. Uh, in order to make a treaty credible, the reputation cost must be clear. They must be accepted by uh, both sides. Uh, they sh both sides should view the uh, rule of law as a top priority, which cannot be uh, violated. And there is some research that uh, focused on the public in order to, to actually test if those kinds of arguments uh, are, uh, are really uh, take effect in reality. So what they did is that they used experimental methods to test uh, 
how much does violations of international uh, law affect the perceptions of the violating actor? And their evidence actually supported that argument, showing that uh, respondents rejected violating behavior. But it also showed that the agreements themselves create for the public that later rejected the, viol the violators, the agreements themselves created uh, expectations regarding compliance. So the fact that there are those kinds of agreements led the public to have expectations that if there are agreements that have already been signed, we should comply with them. That's the effect of the agreements themselves on the expectation of the public for the behavior of the government. We still need to take some of those results uh, cautiously. First of all, we remember the idea of generalizing from survey, re survey results. I've talked about that. I explained the problems with generalizing uh, uh, public opinions, but I also talked about some of the ways in which we should be less concerned about that, but that's not the point here. Uh, mostly I wanna talk about uh, conditions that can actually lead to uh, different views, mostly led by electoral incentives. So if the uh, political candidate, which I support, argues that we should not uh, comply with the international agreement because it has X, Y, Z cost for us, then maybe even if I'm a person that cares a lot about reputation and I'm concerned about the fact that maybe the United States will suffer from a reputation cost in case of reneging on some agreements, maybe because my political candidate promotes those kinds of ideas, maybe I will actually change my view in this case. And it's, I'm not giving you any specific examples, but you know that's, that's the idea behind that as the power of electoral incentives in this case. There are other problems in the context of reputation. First of all, it's a problematic concept because sometimes it's hard to observe the, actor, the, action, the actions of others. So if I can observe that, I'm not necessarily uh, facing the problems of reputation. Another uh, element which might be problematic is when one side of the, of the uh, interaction that leads to the agreement doesn't value the future as much as the other. If I care less about the future in my interactions with my adversary, then maybe I will not comply with the agreement. I don't care about my reputation because I don't care about the future in this case. And the third act, uh, act, uh, factor that comes into play here is different domestic conditions. And that's where there is a, there's a mix between the domestic motivations of political uh, leaders to appease their domestic public, or sometimes actually fall through with the, uh, and comply with the international agreement. That's gonna lead me to the next topic that I'm gonna talk about in this context, and that's the domestic, uh, the role the domestic audiences and domestic institutions play in this case. Uh, compliance may be dependent on internal dynamics, and it, may be, it might lead uh, governments to violate international treaties because politicians want to appease their supporters. That's one side of that. That's like the negative effect that those kinds of motivations can have on in the context of uh, compliance with international treaties. On the other hand, compliance uh, may be enhanced because the agreements or the treaties themselves provide information to the public. And if the public consists of individuals that are supportive of uh, compliant, the idea of compliance and the accepting of the rule of law, then by themselves, they should actually criticize the government if the government has any reason or as any uh, in indication that the government is gonna violate the agreement. So the idea behind that is uh, most likely uh, those kinds of arguments can explain why liberal democracies are often better what's called in compliance with international agreements because liberal, liberal uh, societies are more likely to uh, abide by the norms of compliance and the rule of law and they will uh, reject uh, governments that do not abide by those kinds of norms and uh, that's one argument uh, in that case. Another uh, effect that international uh, treaties can have on domestic uh, dynamics is treaties can actually encourage local groups to mobilize and demand compliance from the government. If this kind of an agreement goes through a ratification process or should go through, into, is planned to go through the ratification process, it makes the issue, the treaty issue even more 
um, legitimate. It can serve as a link to the identity of the society, of the public in this case. It also makes the issue more legitimate by uh, attracting media attention, recruitment of allies, and overall makes the issue a lot more important. Uh, those kinds of issues are more likely based on uh, the, the more likely issues for those kinds of agreements are human rights, and I'll talk about human rights in a few minutes also, uh, whether it is civil rights, women rights, children rights, whatever types of human rights we're talking about here, this kind of dynamics uh, can take play, but this is where we should remember the effect of domestic institutions in, in the sense of the regime type. In stable autocracies, it's much harder to almost impossible for members of the public to mobilize. So those kind of dynamics are not likely to take place. In stable democracies, the problem mostly is motivation, right? So maybe we will agree to sign on the petition that somebody puts on their Facebook or Twitter page, but how much more are we willing to do in order to fight for the rights of human rights or women, or women rights in Africa? It's harder to generate this kind of motivation for mobilization and then demanding pressure on the government when it comes to uh, democracies. The more likely outcome is that in partial and transiting democracy and transitioning democracies, those kinds of dynamics are more likely to take place because in those kinds of regimes, mobilization becomes uh, uh, more likely to take place. And those types of issues when it comes to human rights are very important for the public. So it's easier, they have the motivation to mobilize and actually pressure the government to accept those kinds of international agreements. Now, all that discussion about how an international agreement leads to mobilization by the public, which puts pressure on the government to comply with it, or the elements I talked about earlier, whether the government has motivations to violate the international agreements because of domestic incentives, goes back to the issue of the direction of causality when it comes to those kinds of uh, matters. Do domestic condition leads to the adoption or seeking of those kinds of agreements when it comes to human rights, trade agreements, whatever that is? Or is it actually international conditions which leads to the creation of those kinds of agreements between different actors and that then that creeps into the uh, to domestic setting itself? Uh, so that's one question about that and uh, we can think about that, that can lead us to think about the international treaties from the system perspective. So uh, we can talk about explaining uh, the motivation for them based on constructivism theory. Reminding constructivism theory focuses on the aspects of norms and values, but looking at them from the more uh, system standpoint and not specifically within the countries. So a constructivist approach to treaties and compliance will place much stronger emphasis on social norms and accepting the rules of the law. It makes public discourse uh, about legitimacy as a very important factor in conditioning behavior. Uh, beliefs and values become critical components of compliance. And those kinds of factors are, of course, if we're thinking about it again, under the approach or under the view of constructivism, it depends on socialization processes that lead to the acceptance of those kinds of norms. And there's different types of processes. When it comes to uh, accepting those kinds of norms and how that trickles into accepting those kinds of agreements. So we think about uh, one process is a coercion or conditioning, which is setting a system of rewards and punishments for at least for the uh, elites. A second process here is what's called Acculturation, which I hope I, I'm spelling it correctly. The idea behind that, that this is different signals used to signal uh, socially accepted behavior and how those kinds of actions fit with the international standard. That should lead to the acceptance of those norms even more and then acceptance of those uh, treaties. And the third is what's called normative persuasion. And this is based on the power of uh, argumentation and deliberation intended to alter uh, individuals' values, attitudes, and identities, all of that is intended to lead to the change in behavior towards compliance with the agreements. And again, to finish up with the constructivist view of international treaties, the problem, as always, with 
uh, constructivist theories is that having empirical evidence to support those arguments and explaining variations between actors. All right, uh, now I wanna shift and talk about more specific issues where treaties are signed and how some of those mechanisms we talked about, compliance and how compliance based on reciprocity or reputation, how that works. And I don't know if it's a surprise to you or not, and I'm gonna start actually with the more big issues of international relations like wars or trade. I actually wanna talk a little bit today about different types of, uh, other types of international treaties and leave the big topics for a discussion later. So now you have it. Uh, I'll talk actually about a little bit about uh, environmental regulation, international treaties, which are focusing on that. There's more and more research on that topic lately. One of the most important aspect to ensure compliance when it comes to international to environmental regulation from that standpoint is transparency, of course. And a lot of the research in that case uh, focuses on the design of international treaties and how they uh, create incentives for actors to comply with the regulations or actually to not comply them, to defect from those kinds of agreements and continue with pollution or whatever the negative outcomes are. Uh, the focus of agreement has to also think about, has to also consider what are the responsibilities of the government in this case. And those can include the, whether the government has the capacity to implement a complex uh, regulatory agreements. A lot of those types of agreements involve the institution of a lot of regulations when it comes to those agreements are signed in the international scale. And then when we take those agreements and we take them into reality in our own country, in our own state, we need to, to uh, introduce a lot of uh, complex regulations. So the government needs to have the capacity to do that. The government needs to have the, the option or and the motivation also to constrain the uh, behavior of private actors, which are important in this specific treaty area. And I'll get to that in a second. And lastly, whether the government has the, pos the option to use positive or negative motivations to lead to this compliance. And <clears throat> one of the differences between those kinds of treaties in the area of environmental regulations, unlike treaties when it comes to international to national security or on some level trade, but national security is a other different, is that private actors are a central component of those types of agreements. They're the ones that has to adhere to the details of those agreements, which means they have to comply with them. And, sorry, and they have a lot of incentives not to comply with those kinds of agreements because of competition when it comes to the private market and compliance with uh, international agreements when it comes to environmental regulations are very costly especially early on when those kinds of uh, companies do a substantial amount of investment in their product whatever that is and that's uh, that places a, a very hard a very strong resistance by those kinds of actors when it comes to uh, comply with those agreements and to use that to, to talk about that i'll use a little bit of one example that's the Deepwater Horizon explosion, which took place in April 2010. The rig is off the coast of uh, the Alabama-Louisiana coast. Um, the rig has been uh, leaking for some time at that. And during that time, eventually, it was a very substantial explosion, which led to a severe leak of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. The estimated uh, size of the uh, leak at the time was about 4.9 million barrels, and it says have been spilling for a lot of time after the explosion. The United States government has launched several investigations into the incidents. They found the main culprit in this case was uh, British Petroleum, which was the energy company that was responsible for the rig. But there was also responsibility laid upon the rig operator and several other companies. And it, whatever, now it doesn't matter to talk specifically about who was responsible, but those investigations uh, present the arguments that the problems were safety and security protocols that were altered or loosened. And the motivation for those kinds of protocols was mostly the reduction of costs. So it was very hard to convince those companies to follow the strict guidelines or the strict regulations in order to ensure the safety of those rigs. 
overall, the uh, other elements that were mentioned in those reports were systematic failures of the American government when it comes to uh, instituting those regulations. And that comes back to another point that I talked about in the previous slide, as well as overall industry standards when it's come to it. So this is just one example to how hard it is to ensure compliance by private actors uh, with those kinds of regulations. Now the damages from this specific incident were severe. Uh, natural effects were felt across the entire Gulf, not just and they were not just focused on the areas of the Alabama and Louisiana coast. Some reported damages as far as the Florida coast, the western coast of Florida, or even the, the, some of the coasts here in Texas. And of course, the harm to wildlife was uh, significant, was enormous, and it has, it has persisted for many years even after the incident itself, whether it is the wildlife that lives in the coast that are adjacent to the Gulf or just wildlife that's living in the, in the Gulf themselves. So the, the damages were very severe, and that shows how much of a problem those kinds of uh, those kinds of situations can be and to ensure compliance or to increase the odds of compliance there's different support mechanism when it comes to environmental treaties one of them may be union laborers and the local ports which can fight against violations about those kinds of private actors an important role is being played by ngos non-governmental organizations which also places uh, civil society as an important actor in uh, ensuring compliance by those kinds of regulations. There's some research on that and the, the empirical evidence suggests that a greater participation by NGOs and the incorporation of a corporate interest mediation increase the likelihood of compliance, which the implication of these arguments is that when we involve uh, non-business actors in those kinds of negotiations, then compliance is more likely to be successful when it comes to compliance with uh, uh, international agreements, which involve many different actors. So that's, that's one aspect here. Sorry about that. All right, so that's one of those issues, which uh, issue areas where international agreements are being signed and some of the how the different elements lead to the, to the signing of those kinds of uh, treaties and the problems that are associated with it. Another area, I promised you that I will return to human rights and now we come back to it. That's another uh, substantial field of research. But the area of human rights is different from a lot of other areas of research and other areas of international treaties because of some, re but there are some reasons for that. First of all is the idea of how important that is now it is important to all, we should also think about, we should all care about human rights, but how much are we willing to actually sacrifice in order to ensure the, uh, the, the, the safety or the human rights of people in other countries? So if we live here in the United States, how much are we willing to fight for the human rights of the civilians living in Rwanda? It is an important issue, but it's very hard to actually motivate people to uh, to uh, take action in that case, which makes it harder to ensure compliance. Uh, reciprocity, which is a central uh, enforcement mechanism when it comes to treaties overall, is uh, not a main issue when it comes to human rights, which harms the, by the, uh, the, the design of the uh, treatment, and it makes it harder to create those self-enforcing treaties. Um, other issues. Lastly, human rights mostly include non-material types of issues. It's not trade, it's not goods, it's not money, it's not investing more. It's human respect, it's human dignity. It's what every person should have, which means it requires a very strong theoretical and normative foundation in the creation of the agreements, which again makes it a lot harder to actually offer more practical or substantive types of agreement and relate to the other problem. So that's some of the reasons why human rights treaties are different and when it comes to thinking about it as, a, as an international treaties. Um, one of the approaches that's been taken in order to increase the likelihood of enforcement or the, excuse me, uh, increase the likelihood of compliance when it comes to those kinds of treaties is a focus on persuasion, a discussion that's going to lead to a change of ideas, 
what exactly does it mean to have an appropriate types of behavior that's going to make those kinds of issues human rights issues are more salient to the population in the areas where we're trying to increase the compliance with those kinds of agreements that can lead to the acceptance of uh, laws in the uh, domestic area if we are able to lead or to promote official ratification what makes it even more important because it compels the local government to uh, to justify and to behave in ways that are fitting with the different provisions of the treaty. So that's the idea of how in places where uh, human rights are not the, that uh, salient, how we can actually lead by persuasion and slow promotion of uh, ideas, how to lead what exactly is appropriate behavior and how those kinds of agreements can become uh, more uh, prominent and being enforced. Enforcement, of course, as always, is the problem in those kinds of agreements. So as an example, uh, a study from uh, a couple of years ago have tested the uh, effect that ratifying the uh, CAT treaty, which is a treaty related to the convention against torture within repressive regime, how that's gonna, uh, how those two things are working together. The questions that were studied was not just wide ratification, but also do the uh, relevant uh, countries also keep with the uh, different uh, elements of the agreement. What the research has shown that when the repressive regime wanted to co-opt the competition or allow some degree of political com competition for its own benefit, they tend to accept ratification as kind of a concession. So they will ratify the agreement in order to uh, show some kind of political competition or some kind of uh, uh, you know, interactions between sides. However, the fact that there is no uh, international uh, enforcement mechanism means that ratification within those kinds of regimes, in most cases, is just for uh, just for show. Uh, so the, the, those kinds of research research has shown that there's no particular differences between oppressive regimes that ratify this specific kind of treaty, the CAT treaty, and those that do not ratify that when it comes to the question to how much they actually use torture. So if you ratified or you did not ratify that, the use of torture is not affected by the ratification process. So that's kind of some of those problems and how uh, uh, compliance is very hard uh, to uh, secure. The last issue I wanna talk about is treaties in the area of uh, conflict situations or national security. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit now to end today's uh, lecture. I'm gonna talk about it a lot more with different types of treaties when it comes to national security. And I'll talk about that on a uh, Thursday's lecture. So, okay. Um, international legal agreements and treaties are important when it comes to the relationship between uh, states. That's the relationship which involve war or involve peace, whatever that is. Uh, the most uh, prevalent types of international treaties are alliances or defense pacts, but there's also peace agreements between warring sides. There can be agreements which set up territorial boundaries. So there's a lot of examples of that. And the more general ones, which do not have to uh, account for just two specific actors in the war, is the agreement which uh, international treaties, which describe the laws of war. Um, Thinking about all those kinds of agreements from a rational perspective, the main problem that we're facing is the idea of credible commitment. Um, the treaties that are signed are intended to uh, help states signal that they are serious in terms of complying with the agreement. And as one example, we can think about alliances. So signing an alliance presents a strong single a signal that the state is serious in its intention to intervene militarily if its counterpart is uh, being attacked or faces war. And overall, in terms of the empirical evidence, most alliances uh, uh, throughout history has been kept with its own, of course, uh, differences that some of them are not. But according to uh, many of the studies, they show that 
alliances are mostly kept based on the mechanism of reputation. So states are persisting or keeping with the alliance obligations because they don't want to suffer those reputation costs. So if the United States, for example, let's say if the United States has an alliance with Germany, then it's less the reciprocity among them because if we think about alliance in the context of military and national security, it's not that Germany can necessarily provide any kind of help to the United States when it comes to its own uh, national security. It can, but not in the same sense. It's mostly the idea of reputation. So the United States is going to keep the alliance with Germany because they don't want to suffer the reputation cost of not keeping with, with the alliance. The same, uh, the same arguments also apply to Germany on the other side. So alliances, as an example for international treaty, are usually uh, kept and there is, a, there is compliance, but there are conditions, more general conditions, that can lead to violations of, uh, of treaties, and those conditions are mostly related to the mechanism critical of the uh, commitment problem, which I talked about, and I'll get to that now. One, if there is a significant change in the relative power among actors, so if I sign, if I'm country A and I signed a peace agreement with country B, but now all of a sudden, or after a gradual uh, process, I'm a lot more powerful than my rival, which I signed agreement with, maybe I have incentives to renege in the agreement because of that change in power. A change in domestic constitution can also explain incentives to renege on agreement. And if I now, again, country A, suddenly sign an agreement with country C, so I have a new external alliance, which may provide me more benefits than the existing alliance, then again, coming back to the discussion I had earlier about the cost and benefits of alliances. Maybe now it's not as beneficial for me to keep the agreement with country B, and I prefer to keep the agreement with country C, so I actually will renege or uh, violate the agreement. So that's a uh, part of it. Uh, before talking about uh, the very final topic for today, I'll start for today's attendance word. So for today, attendance is the word boys, boys as in many boys, that's for today. All right, uh, one type of uh, international treaty when it comes to uh, issues of security and conflict is the treaties that relate to the laws of war. And there's been some study on those issues. The questions that, uh, that scholars have focused on is if states that uh, um, ratified treaties that spell out the conditions for the laws of war actually behave in the same way, whether they comply with the rules that those kinds of treaties are, are uh, presenting. So do states that ratify treaties comply with the laws of war, which more uh, on the ground is that mean, do the armies of those states target civilians, even though the states have accepted within the international treaty, the laws that forbid the targeting of citizens, of civilians, I'm sorry. So this study by Valentino and his uh, associates have focused on uh, conflicts during the 20th century and whether the countries that uh, participated in those conflicts have ratified the 1899 and 1907 Hague Convention uh, agreements and the 1949 and then 19, 1977 protocols of the Geneva Convention. So those are the main uh, international conventions which led to the creation of what's called the Laws of War, the Geneva Convention protocols, which provide all the details regarding, uh, including, and some, some of the details include the uh, excluding civilians from uh, being targeted. So what their research has uh, found is that intentional killing of civilians or targeting civilians was mostly correlated with the strategy that those countries have chosen when they persecute war. And it was not influenced at all by ratification of the relevant treaty. So that suggests that the strategic incentives for those countries have been much more important to them than any kind of legal or normative-based considerations of international laws. And that means the bottom line is that civilians remain at high risk, especially, of course, the civilians on my adversary. If I care more about the strategic incentives of what kind of strategy I'm going to use, then I may accept the targeting of civilians as part of that strategy, or maybe not. But what's more important is the strategic situation and not the fact that I do need to refrain from harming civilians, because also because my country has accepted the uh, conditions of those kinds of uh, treaties. 
Now, at the same time, another implications that they point to is there's potentially an indirect effect of, uh, of those treaties that the legal norms which those treaties represent actually are masked behind the selection on strategy. So if countries that ratify those kinds of, uh, of those kinds of treaties are less likely to pursue military strategy which include, laying, which include uh, using the strategy of siege on the enemy or causing starvation for the local populations, that might suggest that those legal uh, elements have an underlying effect on the selection of the strategy. So by accepting those, uh, those kinds of agreements, by ratifying those international uh, treaties, the legal aspect does have an effect on how much likely they, those countries are to target civilians. So that's just one finding. And again, the effect here is indirect and it's hard to show, but that's what they have there. And that's related to the effects of those kinds of uh, treaties. Uh, okay, so that's what I have for today. Those are some additional readings if you're interested in when it comes to international treaties. And with that, I will say to you goodbye and I will see you on Thursday. Bye, everyone.